This video is about interdependence. Interdependence in the global village means many things. First, on an individual level, it means that my actions affect others and the actions of others will affect me. Second, how interdependence in a globalized world plays out between countries is the second large interdimension or dimension of interdependence. This has been both positive and negative on a global level. Since the 1990s, academics, economists, politicians have been challenged to understand the impact of global and regional interdependence. In some way, the Cold War ended and the age of globalization began. In response to globalization, academics, economists, and politicians questioned its benefit. Many people are asked are not pro-globalization, in fact, see a quite a negative uh, impact of this. As a result, in some way, three worldviews have emerged with respect to globalization and interdependence. One is you can call, one we can call the nationalist perspective, the other one the globalized perspective, the pro-global perspective, and the third, globalized yet local view. From a nationalist point of view, nationalist concerns that with respect to the loss of culture. So nationalists say we'll lose our culture. From a national perspective, the rapidly changing world represents a threat to the traditional cultures and even the ways in the local lives of people. So this obstinate nationalistic response is to make the state more prominent, the nation stronger, and resist globalization because glo the global undermines both local and national interests. The second is the globalized view. I suppose the pro-globalized view. And that is that, which is in, in some ways embraced by many people in the world. In some way, as the world becomes more modernized, the functional and technical requirements and bureaucratic and administration, formal education, human rights, and organized science are becoming increasingly similar, making individual nation state look alike. This has been argued by many people. So hence, nationality as a feature of societal and cultural relations will decrease gradually because a narrow nationalistic vision cannot coexist in the globalized world. Hence, globalization is good for business as well. The third view called by some academics called the globalized yet local approach emerged, which maintains that the global and national interests are interconnected and in their interplay actually coexist. Globalization does not necessarily weaken national uniqueness. In fact, the unique national approaches for organizing the local economy are actually being invented and implemented step by step as we speak. Hence the national and globalized worldviews offer only a partial picture of the true nature of globalization. Remember, as I have often said, is that we need to be we need to be cautious of binary worldviews. Binary worldviews are the left will save us, the right will save us, it's globalized, it's nationalized. It it such a, a binary view actually does not really bring us to an understanding of the whole as a systems approach. Globalization and the state in this systems approach or globalized yet local approach, they co-constitute each other because states themselves make globalization, however, are also being made by it. In this context, transnationalism does not have to be in opposition to national interests. Let's have a look at positive global interdependence. And let's have a look at the opportunities, but also the challenges. On the positive side, globalization brought an increase of multinational cooperation. 
many multinational organizations, the United Nations and so on, have come about uh, in order to bring more cooperation on a national level to increase the benefit to all. It brought about the deregulation of financial capital, the deployment of information technologies linking the world, the World Wide Web. People most, almost everywhere also show a favorable perception of globalization when we talk about those things. The way nations operate in the world has created wave after wave of standardized, standardized national policies an explosion in the use of science, an emphasis on individual rights, welfare, equality, empowerment, in some way committing countries to the pursuit of, of collective progress and international cooperation. Let us look at values, understanding and opportunities that are needed to foster interdependence. Well, there are eight aspects of that, and this is what I'd like to discuss in this presentation. And they are basically a global mindset and when the need for a global problems or need for a global solutions to solve global problems, or how interdependent our well-being is, our economics, our political system, our resources, our security, our human rights, and our inter interpersonal cooperation. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, it's a universal law. Intolerance is the first sign of an inadequate education. Intolerance is the first sign of an inadequate education. An ill-educated person behaves with arrogant impatience, whereas a truly profound education breeds humility. Hence, there cannot be peace and progress if there is ignorance and arrogance. There cannot be development and ignorance. The first step that we need in this global village is a global mindset. A view that the global village, that we are increasingly interdependent on each other. First, this global mindset provides us with a more holistic view of our place in the world. Having this is important. And it helps us understand our responsibility as global citizens, which is a real challenge in the world today. Both individuals and nations need to be good global citizens. Understanding is needed how we can coexist, seek mutual prosperity and the common good in the global village. This concept applies to relationships between people but also between nations. The first step in accepting and understanding the, understanding the reality of our interdependence. We need to accept that. Without an in-depth understanding of this interdependence, policymakers across the globe may adopt policies that are nationalistic and appear righteous or populist, but actually without truly understanding the benefits of globalization to their countries may in fact create barriers. So selfish individualism, Dr. and Mrs. Moon have said often that selfish individualism seeks, thinks that the self can exist outside of a relationship with others, people. We need to see the suffering of people as, as if they were our own sons and daughters, brothers and sisters, and mothers and fathers. The challenges we face in our world points to the need for shared understanding based on share, the shared values of altruism, that we care for others, that we understand our interdependence, that we understand our mutual prosperity. This all depends on the values that drive the agenda. Hence, most negative, the most negative problem, it points to the self-interest at the detriment of others. This is the op opposite of cooperation, which is mutually beneficial. The second is the need to foster cooperation, is to find global solutions to global problems. This 
is of great urgency because we are now entering a phase of non-collaboration in the world. At just the moment when global challenges are particularly pressing and require global solutions, our environmental problems cannot be solved by nations. It requires <clears throat> a global solutions. COVID-19 pandemic with its health and economic challenges are also some examples of this. Nationalism has many benefits, but it has no viable plan to run the world. Third is our independent, interdependent well-being. We need to foster cooperation in mental health and physical health, as these are dependent on others. It takes a village to raise a child, to build a tool, to solve a conflict, and to cure a disease. The lesson we've learned from COVID-19 pandemic is the need for global solidarity and collaboration in the area of well-being. Fourth is the need to foster economic interdependence and opportunities. Economic interdependence covers a whole range of, of topics and aspects. I, I will only cover a few, but even very briefly. However, economic globalization gave rise to many benefits, but also to some very clear vulnerabilities. And it actually, and these created new kinds of conflict. The rapid increase in international trade and capital flow associated with globalization show how interdependent our economic systems are. This realization influenced countries to consider the need to either couple or decouple with globalization, which meant that some companies felt that the threats of globalization to their own nations pushed them to reconsider decoupling with the international order economic systems, because this, in fact, was not beneficial to their nations. In fact, the turmoil in the US financial market that was triggered in 2008, the global financial crisis, certainly brought this home. The financial crisis brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic also exemplifies the need for international cooperation. And the lack of cooperation puts the world at risk, both financially, but also with health. Stephen Harper, the former prime minister of Canada, who is a part of Canada, who was in fact the prime minister of Canada during the GFC, argues that we need today, an urge, there's an urgent need for international cooperation during and after the pandemic. He said that shortly after the global financial crisis began, in fact, a meeting of the world's biggest economies and its leading international finance institutions were held. Within a few days, an international plan was drafted to deal with the crisis. It involved the significant international cooperation and in fact avoided many potentially damaging actions as a result of the global financial crisis. However, now during the pandemic, there has been nothing resembling such international cooperation. And this is a worry. So today there is a serious lack of global leadership. First, the United States is not willing to provide it. This is not just about the current US administration, but in some way we have to understand that even the American public is frustrated with its global leadership role and the burden that's been put on the United States, which has often left the United States disproportionately, the obligations are disproportions for which the public in some way see little proportional benefit. China, on the other hand, cannot fill the void of this global leadership because it is not widely trusted. When we look at the role of how the, the, spy, the, the virus spread and the little cooperation there was, we can see why people are skeptical. However, the European Union also is not in that position to lead 
because of the internal divisions that are occurring there. Hence, Stephen Harper said, this is why it is essential that we understand our interdependence in this world and work together to rebuild our mutual prosperity and act on shared values rather than zero-sum strategies. You see, a zero-sum game is a situation where one party loses and the other one wins. So a zero-sum game means that there is no development of wealth. The wealth remains zero. There's no growth. There's only one person wins, the other one loses. In a non-zero-sum game, however, an optimal solution can be found because of overlapping interests leading to what we call a gain to both parties or a win-win. One of the vulnerabilities uh, of our economic and political system is what we call chain, academics call chain globalization. And that is that instead of liberating people, businesses and governments, globalization has actually entangled them politically and economically in ways that some feel are not beneficial. So for example, economic coercion can be used as a tool to meet national interests. And we see that across the globe at this time. Economic capabilities can be translated into political influence over other states, which can be sometimes very negative to states. So although there is the positive view of globalization, this is one concern. But this concern of chain globalization suggests here again the importance of shared values in the global village. And the number one is altruism, to consider others. The negatives of chain globalization in, suggest that Yes, interdependence is in fact can be a very negative thing, but it can also be a very positive thing. Fifth is our interdependent resources. Okay, we need to foster cooperation in how we manage natural resources. That's a given. For Australia, for example, in Australia, it is widely accepted that water resources develop, water resource development in river basins require careful consideration of the interdependencies between water withdrawals of users, wastewater discharge, and irrigation flows. There are so many examples of the interdependence of resources. Sixth is the need to foster cooperation in the area of security. In an inter interdependent world, it is vital that we collaborate closely with our partners to improve a, a global rapid alerting and response system in relation to chemical, biological, and nuclear agents and pandemics. In the nuclear era, states should work to make their decision transparent and predictable. Again, we are interdependent on each other for our security. Most of all, we need to rid ourselves of biological and nuclear weapons. Seventh is the need to foster cooperation and opportunities in the era, area of human rights. The fulfillments of rights to health may depend on the rights to development, to education, and to information. Again, we can see that health, education, information are all interdependent. The UN General Assembly approved the, uh, the approval by the UN General Assembly of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a significant moment in human history with respect to cooperation to foster human rights. The principles of interdependence on the basis of human right is implicit in the Declaration. The Declaration gave voice to the conscience of a global humanity. Yet today, the hopes set out in this document have been surely tested. No country in the world could be said to have met the standards. And eighth is the need to foster people-to-people -people cooperation. First, in the global village, it is important that we make effort to communicate with members of def different ethnic groups, different cultural groups that we would not necessarily relate to. 
Second is our interpersonal cooperation, that we can learn to work together. And third is our interpersonal values and ethics are linked to our global economic system. What I do affects the global economic system. How? Well, for instance, when economic systems and institutions act unethically and do so on my behalf, on our behalf, we are tied to these actions, even if we're not even aware of those actions. So for example, my retirement fund may be invested in mining companies that pollute the environment and manufacturing companies that take advantage of their workers. Justice requires not only values, but an understanding of our interconnectedness, an understanding of cause and effect relationships. Well, once again, thank you for listening.